Hello, that's it. We're live. Hey, Melissa. Hey, Ben. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? I am doing very well. Excellent. I'm very pleased to join us today. Very cool. Very kind of you. Um, so everyone knows you, Melissa Coates. Would you like to introduce yourself, though, a bit about who you are, your background, and how you are where you are today, that kind of thing? Sure, sure. So hi, everybody. I see some familiar names in the list, which is very exciting. So yeah, like Ben said, my name is Melissa Coates. And my background is predominantly in the BI side of things with the lens of an enterprise BI developer. And so that's where I spent, you know, eh, 10 or 15 years, right? <laughs> and I evolved to that from first being an accountant. Uh, and doing very cool things like, oh, you know, started with the traditional VLOOKUPs, right? And doing some it. macros and doing some access databases and found myself being asked to, will you go create a data warehouse for us? And so I got the opportunity to learn the Kimball methodology and all that kind of stuff. And that's that's kind of what set me on the path of BI. Okay. And I always kind of thought it was helpful in some ways and not in some ways, right? Mm. To come from a non-technical background into mm. a technical industry, right? Pros and cons. But um, a few years ago, I found myself at a stage and I think probably a bunch of people will be able to relate to this. I had been a generalist up to that point, right? Okay. Mm. I did ETL, I did data modeling. I did mm. some data viz, right? Mm. Not like Megan, but you know, I dabbled in all of the pieces. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was my strength was how do I put all the pieces together and not necessarily the deep, deep technical expertise in any one piece. Okay. But, you know, we've all seen the data platform just expand. I mean, mm -hmm. to keep up with what's going on in Azure, how do architect data lakes and modern data warehouses and all of the distributed architectures. I mean, it, it's crazy. So a few years ago, I found myself at this point where I said, I got to save myself. I can't be a generalist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I had just spent the last year doing basically three projects in a row where the customer said, because I'd been in consulting for about a decade at that point. Okay. And maybe the year or so was spent with customers saying, how do we implement Power BI? Mm. And most of it was IT hiring us, right? So kind of the certain focus that who would hire a consulting firm to, to try to do this. But nonetheless, I said, I think I've found my niche to where I can narrow my focus at least a little bit, mm. save myself <laughs> and then what you got to do is you got to start to settle for knowing, you know, more about certain things, less about other things, yeah. and just focus on how do all of the puzzle pieces fit together because Power BI does not exist in a bubble. So having said all of that, my current professional focus is Power BI governance, administration, mm. all of those things that say, how do we make it easier for the people that do the development work? to do their jobs. Very cool. Like it. Um, so it kind of seems it wasn't perhaps like always like a half conscious choice. You said, okay, I want to find a, a specific area of knowledge and you kind of fell into that based on questions that have been coming to you. Is that sound about right? Or was it more of a, a conscious thing or like a, like I want, I'm really interested in governance. I want to, I, therefore I want to do that. Or is it just simply because the customers have been coming to you saying, okay, this is interesting for you. I need help on this. And you, something that you felt, found yourself going back, back to. Some of both. Because you know when you're in consulting, you can say, I want to do these kinds of projects. But then there's also the issue of what projects come up. Mm. So, you know, there's some of that. And so I liked the let's dig into the governance side of things more. Mm. And especially back at that time, if I, if I rewind three or four years, especially since I came from that enterprise BI background, my initial inclinations were to be a little bit more rigid and controlling if you were. And I've 
I've backed up on some of that mm -hmm. in the last few years, right? And um, and really gotten more comfortable with saying, yeah, we need some chaos. <laughs> we got to let people do what they need to do just, you know, within the guardrails that, yeah. that we establish. So, so yeah, it was, it was kind of some of both. Um, for a little while, I dabbled with data lakes and, you know, I could have gone that direction, but that would require, you know, really a lot of knowledge about the big data architectures, right? And that kind of stuff. And so I, I kind of chose this path. It's a cool path. It's, I think, I say things that it could be a path that is sometimes, or a topic that I feel is sometimes a bit overlooked, but I mean, that's just me. And um, it's not the sort of thing that people focus on so much or even understand of what it even is when they're getting started with Power BI, or even if they've been working with the tool for quite a long time, this topic of, of governance might not come up until quite a late stage. Um, True. Yeah. True. So, you know, there's a bunch of different ways you can get started with Power BI, right? But it's not uncommon for there just to be some people that figure out, oh, we might already have a Power BI license, right? Maybe they have an E5 or whatever. Yeah. They start to do some things, very cool, very industrious people start to deploy some things. IT has no idea, right? And a year later, there's this awareness that, oh, we have people producing reports from where, mm -hmm. right? And then there's this awareness that, okay, we need to figure out what's going on and add some consistency, maybe reduce some risk, yeah. that sort of thing. And then there's the complete opposite of, we want to roll out Power BI, but we want to figure everything else out first. We're not going to let anybody have a license until we know what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, that happens too. But the first one's, you know, fairly common. Yeah. If you could, I mean, put it basically like you know, a brief explanation, what would, what is, this is a really basic question, but to get it covered, what is governance? What is Power BI governance? What, how do you describe that? What's the, the concept? What do you do with it? Yeah. So first of all, let's, let's first say that governance is not the exact same thing as administration. So I want to start there because I hear okay. some people sometimes online almost use the terms interchangeably. Okay. And while sometimes inside of a company, we can use terms one way, right? We've, we've all seen instances of saying, what's a data warehouse mean to you, right? Yeah. Those, those sorts of things. But in general, governance would be about what are the rules, processes, standards that we need to follow hmm. within our organization. So when we're talking about governance, we're really usually talking more about let's bring some order to some chaos. Hmm. But, 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 <laughs> we want to say wherever possible when we're doing that with a tool like Power BI, how do we do that with user enablement in mind, right? How do we help our users be productive and efficient hmm. while we adhere to those requirements and, and we meet our regulations and whatever else. Okay. So the, the administration side of things, and a lot of times in some of the stuff that we're publishing for Microsoft, we actually call it system oversight. So administration, system oversight, I see those as absolutely being interchangeable. Okay. That's just really saying how do we bring to life those governance decisions, those day-to-day -day activities? Mm -hmm. So the administrator might go set some tenant settings, for instance, who's allowed to create a workspace based on the governance decision that we made about that. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff. Is it this so once you have therefore that your your governance safe you from the from the early stage, you're looking at your governments, the governance, the way this is kind of set up. Is it something that you find that once it's kind of you've established what it is and how you're going to work it, it doesn't necessarily need a lot of work after that, or is it something that needs to be constantly maintained, constant, constantly looked at? It's a constant struggle. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's never done, right. and so the way I usually phrase it because it can be so utterly overwhelming. And 
I'll double back here in a second to talk about, there's kind of two main places where I spend most of my time these days. I've got this online course and then I publish stuff for Microsoft. And, and both of those contribute to this utterly overwhelming comment, right? But the way that I tend to focus on it is, is to think more short-term than long-term. And yes, we need to know kind of where we need to go. But we also need to just focus on what are our priorities. Is there a certain risk item that is something we need to focus on in the next month or three months or whatever and build out what are we doing this quarter, next quarter? And yeah, we might have some idea of where we want to get to by next year, for instance. Mm. But to build this huge grand long-term plan just in today's Mm. world, doesn't exist. So there's this combination of let's just take take them as they come, right? The the most pressing needs. Mm. Um, and so we've published on the Microsoft side. Um, I work with Matthew Roche and Alex Powers, who are both on yes. the the customer advisory team, and Peter Myers. So he's mm-hmm. another Microsoft MVP. He's involved with us as well. And we've published this thing called the Power BI Adoption Roadmap. That's, that's exactly what I wanted to bring up. Very cool. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and it's got these 10 areas of things you want to think about. Things like user empowerment. Things like your center of excellence. Things mm-hmm. like your community of practice, etc. And every article concludes with here's these maturity levels that you want to think about. And I mention that because the maturity levels as stated in the articles, they're not perfect. In fact, they're pretty simplistic and they're pretty general because everybody that's reading it has a little different situation, right? How have they attacked Power BI so far? What are they even trying to do with Power BI? How centralized or decentralized are they? What's their current state? How reactive or proactive are they? I mean, there's like, it's all a Rubik's Cube. So um, what what we published those for, though, is this introducing the idea of for each one of these 10 areas, you can think about where are you now and where you want to be. So for instance, if you have a lot of decentralized users in your org. They all produce a lot of data on their own, right? And they do data ownership and management, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're going to probably want to put more effort and more maturity into things like your training programs Mm -hmm. and your user support and that community of practice and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you don't do a lot of that, you might say, yeah, we're not very mature in that level, but we're very, very centralized, so we don't need to be, right? So you can kind of customize those levels and then back to the whole take them as they come comment, right? Say, all right, this quarter, we want to make a little progress here. Mm. But it's never ending and there's so, so, so many things to think about. Yeah, Uh, I mean, to be honest, uh, it's one of the things that I try to think about, but quite often maybe falls to the wayside. And I think to have someone at a company or certainly on projects who is just handling this quite frequently would make things so much easier. Because I think for a lot of people, when you, depending on the size of your team, of course, and what people, people's responsibilities are, people quite often forget and they just want to produce produce reports, produce, give me metrics, give me, give me KPIs, and then all this other stuff can quite easily just fall out of sight if it's not known that it's such a such an important topic you know if you have someone who's like a team of people who are basically work with power bi absolutely to push out reports and some of that happening first Hmm. is not a bad thing because guess what now we have people with real knowledge and we know what they're trying to accomplish now Hmm. is it possible that we need to adjust what they're doing just a little bit right? Perhaps they have been publishing all of their reports to their own personal workspace and Mm -hmm. sharing them from there. And maybe we need to educate them on here's a better way and why. And that better way is to use standard workspaces and use in general Mm -hmm. workspace security apps, 
ahead of the individual item sharing. But I digress, right? So that's just bringing a little order to the chaos, right? And that's one of those little baby steps to governance that we can take that can get a lot of benefit and reduce the risk, especially if, you know, one person needs to go on vacation and, you know, stuff is stuck in their own personal workspace, et cetera. Can you turn off my workspace? Because I really don't like it. <laughs> no, okay. no. Um, there is an item on the release plan, though, that says that a Power BI administrator is going to go and be able to add themselves to someone else's My Workspace. So if you can imagine how today we have in the standard workspaces, we have workspace administrators mm -hmm. and members, contributors, viewers. But it's almost like you're going to be able to be a workspace administrator in someone's personal workspace as well. And that'll be helpful when the Power BI administrator needs to go in there, rescue some content for whatever reason, or fix an issue with refresh because somebody's out of the country for a month, you know, or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but the today the premise is, oh, if it's in my workspace, nobody else can see it or touch it. Mm -hmm. And that's going to go away. So that brings me to, to a good point that we should probably make is that the Power BI administrator role is really a very high privilege role already. Mm -hmm. And it's only going to get more so with the personal workspace access. And the reason I say that is because the Power BI administrator, they can go in and they can adjust all those tenant settings. And that's a pretty powerful thing because all of those settings really impact the user experience, right? Yeah. We we have somebody that's overzealous that says, nope, no exports allowed. I'm going to turn them off. Yeah. Well, you know, who, who decided that <laughs> and why? But so that makes it pretty powerful. And then also they can update and add themselves or someone else mm. to the access of any workspace. So they don't actually see the data yeah. in the workspaces unless they add themselves, but they have the ability to add themselves or someone else everywhere. Mm. So that again, makes it a very high privilege role. So if you're listening and you have more than eh, two to five people that are assigned to Power BI administrator role, I would ask you why and do they really need that high privilege role? Okay, it's a good question. Well, <laughs> I had to answer that question recently myself when I asked for, the, for, for this role, which I did get. Uh, but I did find it, it interesting. Um, you mentioned with workspace regarding that you can you can add yourself uh -huh. to the workspace and then go into the workspace. Um, that was very helpful, and that's also when I came across uh -huh. this issue with um, the my workspace, which is interesting to me that you just mentioned it, mentioned it. I have recently had an issue where there has been a report that's been published in my workspace and then mm -hmm. that person, you know, leaves the company and then it's like, oh dear, what do we do? Right. So ideally, you want to know that that's happening already from the activity log. Right. And if it just has a couple views here and there, no, we're not going to pick on something that's been shared out of my workspace, right? Mm -hmm. We got to pick our battles. But if we see something is getting whatever the number is, dozens mm -hmm. or hundreds of views, then we need to go say, okay, this belongs elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so hopefully um, we know earlier than when the person leaves the company and everything breaks. <laughs> but, you know, we that's all live goal, in the right? world. Of course that happens too. <laughs> Oh, fantastic! But this, um, the the adoption roadmap is a is a very very cool thing, and I think it's just a sort of the thing that I've looked at, and just by giving it a quick skim, it's like ah yeah okay, there's lots of really cool points in this, and you can break it down into show like yeah, I enjoy the way it's kind of or you can see like point one area description to really go through the points. Um, very very helpful stuff. Very very cool. Um, the Power BI implementation planning. It's is this kind of a work in progress or is it kind of still, still, is it finalized? Is it finished? Ah, all right. I, I, I admit I, I snuck this one in. This was, what do you, what do you call that? A, uh, oh, I forget the expression. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> so the Power BI Adoption Roadmap, if you've been through it, it's almost like, even though we give some suggested action items, 
it's not a step by step. Here's all the things that you should go and do. Right. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, we kind of have this gulf. We've got all of the core detailed product documentation. You know, here's the screen, click this, or here's what this button means, right? The really detailed product mm -hmm. information. And they don't elaborate on why you do stuff. Their goal is to explain what the software does. And they do not offer advice usually. Mm -hmm. And it's very straightforward. And then you got the adoption roadmap where we do offer advice. And a lot of times, uh, Matthew likes to say, sometimes we get into it's hand wavy advice. Yeah, you should do this thing, right? And and sometimes we're in that realm because it's hard to be specific because we're mm. talking to the general customer. But anyway, so if you think about how there's kind of this gulf of how do I get from <laughs> uh, you know to this to this end state of the roadmap? So mm. we introduced this idea of Power BI implementation planning. And if you've been to that spot in the Microsoft Docs, so far, all you see are some usage scenarios. Mm -hmm. And those were a good place for us to start because one of the three purposes of Power BI implementation planning is to replace that older enterprise deployment white paper that I wrote with Chris Webb. And it's almost three years old now. Okay. And we're not touching it anymore. We're, we're not updating it, it's getting refactored into this new thing. So here's the exciting thing to announce, and you can all look forward to this next week. The first couple of areas, real areas, I should say, are going to land in Power BI implementation planning next week. So we started with a simple article and a complex article. Okay. And there's going to be about or I should say subject area. Um, there's gonna be about 20 different subject areas. So we started with tenant setup, the simple one, and workspaces, mm -hmm. the complex one. And those are all gonna land next week. And what's exciting about those is we quite literally have it set up to where, if we take workspaces, for instance, there's tenant level, workspace mm -hmm. considerations, and then there's workspace level considerations. So for instance, the thing I mentioned earlier with who's allowed to create a workspace. Well, that's a tenant level decision, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas when you're down to the individual workspaces, what are the kinds of things you want to think about? Scope, subject area, who needs access to it, right? Mm -hmm. So the entire point of these articles that you haven't seen yet, but you will next week, Every section ends with a checklist. We suggest you do A, B, C, and D. And then this, the text that's before it is not long and verbose because we're not trying to replicate the core docs. We're mm -hmm. trying to give you just enough context to say, why do I care about planning for subject area and scope? of a workspace, for instance, just enough to justify why are you why are we telling you to do this in the checklist? Provide some links back to other information and we keep moving on. So this is going to grow to be a very, very deep set of stuff. And it's going to take us a few months to get it all out. The uh, These first two, like anything, right? Think about your first data model or your first report. The first one, was tough, but now we have a pattern. We'll get some feedback from these first ones as well. Um, besides tenant setup and workspaces, just to kind of let you know what's coming. Data protection is next. We're having yeah, nice. some conversations next week with some subject matter experts. Mm. Can you imagine they have some feedback on my draft? Oh, my and uh, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. <laughs> uh, security, another biggie, yeah. that one's your development right now and Perfect. right on the heels of that priority wise is auditing and monitoring just gonna Ooh. be a painful one to write that's so, a toughie does yeah so those are the first what five of the 20 ish that will land over wow. the next few months that sounds really cool i'm very much looking forward to it um, it's so much fun and if i can just stay on record matthew roche is so wonderful to work with we just think the same like we have mm. different styles and different personalities right mm -hmm. um and you know 
I abhor his music taste and he thinks mine is bad. <laughs> right. But nonetheless, we, we think the same. So we kind of jive uh, mm. with, with all of that kind of stuff. So to Jeff's point, I'm not seeing most of these comments because I can't talk and think. Yeah, really it's tough. Time, but yes, I, I do absolutely love writing this stuff. So if you've ever noticed that, yes, my YouTube channel and my blog are a little neglected <laughs> between my online course and all of the technical writing for Microsoft, I I don't end up getting much time to do as much as I want to on this other stuff. So, hey. Yeah, you spread yourself too thin. It's uh, it's not a good thing. I have to go on more random questions now. Your music taste with Matthew, Matthew. Very different. So I've got to ask. So what's your? I know if I've seen Matthews. What's your music taste? Oh, if I had my first choice, uh, you know, give me like um, Fleetwood Mac, Eagles, right? That nice. Okay. You know, um, uh, you know, seventies rock. It's like road stuff. trip music. This is, um, yeah, give me some nice road trip music. That would be perfect. Uh, like James it. Taylor's pretty good too. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, one second. I brought up the wrong <laughs> question here. I always bring up the wrong stuff. Um, what's this? Woody, I'm a writer, nonfiction. Sorry, I thought it was a question. I don't really understand it. My bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no idea. Um, so, yes, that would be a nice. Um, interesting mix of music if you were to work in the same office between you and Matthew, right? To kind of get that uh, atmosphere going between you two in the office, a bit of the uh, and, heavy metal and uh, your uh, stuff. I know, and I'm trying to come up with an idea. He'll be more clever about this sort of thing than I will. So we'll see if we can loop that in somehow. We're doing a pre-con together at the PASS Data Community Summit in November. So... I'm very nice. I gotta admit, I'm a little nervous about going and being around all those people. But uh, uh, I decided to put my fear to the side because that was the only reason that I was uh, not saying yes. So, um, so we're doing an all day pre con on the Power BI adoption roadmap kind of stuff. So um, we'll see. I expect that it will be fun and informative, and uh, we will do our very best to make it well worth everyone's time. I'm sure it'll be absolutely wonderful. And by then you'll have brought out more of your um, things that we're talking about before with these step-by-step, -step. you'll be very well advanced with it. So that should be, uh, you'll have plenty to talk about as well, I'm sure. Very cool. Um, loads of other stuff that you have, you have going on. So I'm very much interested in learning more about your, uh, you have, one thing I have to come back to before you talk about the difference between governance and admin. So you've we've spent the time talking about the, the, the governance part. The admin part, would you say, if you're looking at it, you see you talk about governance and you also work with admin, kind of equally as important as one another or one can't exist without the other or you can forget one part and do one part? Yeah, so this is tricky to answer because Sorry. we always just, no, 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 it's a perfect question. We always haphazardly do whatever is most urgent, right? Mm. So if you have a brand new Power BI tenant or you even just figure out that, oh, this thing exists, let me see what's going on, right? What's the first thing you're gonna go do? Well, you're gonna go look at those tenant settings and see, are they, are they the way you want them to be, right? Have you actually had governance decisions? <laughs> about what to do about all those tenant settings, right? So you got a little bit of the cart and the horse happening. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the adoption roadmap, we tried to sequence those, those 10 areas. Mm -hmm. And it's not perfect because we all work a little bit here and a little bit there. And you're always going to do a little bit of administration early mm -hmm. uh, and then come back to it. But technically speaking, uh, the system oversight, we call it, on the adoption roadmap, is actually listed last. And the reason for that is because you wanna be informed by all of these other things that are happening, including governance, before you enact that all with your administration or your system oversight. But in reality, it doesn't literally sequentially happen last. So um, I have mixed feelings about the fact that we kinda of had to number them one to 10 because when we're writing for the Microsoft Docs platform, any of the images that we use, we have to 
have a table beneath it that fully walks through the image. So mm -hmm. everything has like a, a one and a two and a three and these ugly little, you know, red numbers that I'm forced to use. But um, and that's all for accessibility purposes, right? So that if somebody couldn't actually see the image and they read the walkthrough of it, would they get the same thing from it? But guess what? It helps all of us to walk through item one, item two, item three. So anyways, the sequence uh, definitely isn't perfect, but that's the method to the madness of where it is. Exactly. What would you say, maybe like a two questions in one here. What would you say is the mistake that you see most often or have seen most often when you look at people or companies adopting Power BI? Or what's the biggest mistake you've ever seen? <laughs> Oh gosh, biggest mistake I've ever seen. That's a, yeah, you, I'd have to think about that for a second here. Um, it, it, or generally speaking, the one that you see the most, like the, I've asked a tough question. I'm sorry. It is a tough question. Um, I'm going to pull just the first thing that comes to mind just because, so I've seen two different companies kind of very IT driven but say, nope, we're not going to allow any Power BI licenses or any Power BI usage until we figure everything out. And I mean for like a six, eight month period of time. And yeah, I was the consultant involved in this. And, you know, in hindsight, could I have pushed? I only have so much authority, right? But, you know, we aren't sure what we want to do yet. So we're not going to let anybody touch Power BI. And guess what? People are going to keep doing whatever it is they can possibly do, right? Mm -hmm. Excel, access, whatever. And I'm not saying those tools are bad because no tool is inherently good or bad. But when we have tools like, and I know Alex is going to love this, right? We can start automating that copy, paste, export stuff with your Power Query routines and make things more efficient for people. We reduce your risk, right? Don't we want to at least let people get started with that? So it's this, it's this balance of we want to get things done and let people get started. But yet we know we need to make some decisions. And it, that's what's so hard, right? Mm -hmm. I'm constantly saying when I'm talking to people, there's no one right way to do things, right? Or one right answer to most questions people ask me, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're like doing one extreme of self-service everything, we don't care. Mm. That's probably way too much risk. And if you're controlling and locking down everything, mm. right, and holding everybody mm. off, that's that's bad too. And I, I've seen that to where people mm. were like, they were they were wanting to use Power BI so badly, and it was mm. it was interesting to watch. And and the reason that they kept asking for it. There was a, um, a subdivision or a, a divisional unit in Europe that had mm -hmm. talked to the right executive and they got allowed to use Power BI before anybody else. And IT was livid about that, right? <laughs> but, you know, who you talk to, mm -hmm. uh, good old political stuff. And they started creating some of the most engaging looking reports. I have no idea how sound their data modeling practices are, et cetera, et cetera. But their reports were beautiful. And mm. guess what? Word was spreading. Mm. So quite literally, I was back in back in the day, right, when we were in offices, um, I was with people and somebody would stop the person I'm working with and say, when can I get on your Power BI training schedule? I mm. really want you know, and that's an interesting demand to see that just sort of naturally build up yeah. in the organization. And IT was like, no, we are not ready, even though Europe got it. So whatever. That's tough. Yeah. The frustrating element of that is that I, I do maintain one of the, the huge advantages of working with Power BI is the fact that it is so accessible. For the desktop perspective, you get it, it's on your desktop, it's right there. There's no... We will do, we will come to your office and we will do like a free demo or something. It's just you download Power BI Desktop, it's right there on your computer, and you can kind of start creating stuff. So to have an IT in the background sitting, just going, but going, stop. That's as far as you're going to get. 
Yeah, I get a I get a little antsy when I see sort of general advice to say, oh, I would usually, for instance, you know, the biggie is let's turn off export to Excel. And I'm the first person to say, I would rather you use analyze in Excel that's mm. live connecting to the data mm. rather than exporting it and creating duplicate copies, right? I've got that enterprise BI background. I like a centralized data warehouse, which mm. means I don't like a bunch of data duplication. Now, of course, we're going to have it. But I'm the first person to say, yeah, let's encourage that. But instead of turning it off, I would much rather see people, let's monitor this on the activity log. And then when we see someone using a lot of exports, let's go talk to them. Mm. Let's find out, what are you doing with those exports? Can we help you be more efficient? And maybe there's a darn good reason for it. Yeah. And maybe they'll be open to it. And maybe they won't, but you know, we can try. That's such a reasonable answer. It's so nice to actually look at things and instead of just saying, no, I don't like it, switch it off, which is more the sort of thing that I would probably try to do. Um, it's, yeah, it's, and it's, I think, it's fair. Yeah. And I think especially also if we almost go back and I uh, add another answer to your earlier question, <laughs> if you've asked IT to be your Power BI administrator hmm. and they don't actually know and, and some IT people are going to absolutely know what's going on with Power BI, right? But there's also other people that might be assigned as the administrator. And it's one of 10 systems mm. that they are asked to spend a little time on. Mm. So they're not just genuinely familiar with what users are trying to accomplish and need to accomplish. Mm. So when we say what are their goals for what they're trying to accomplish, right? Mm. They, in the Power BI Adoption Roadmap, we talk a lot about things like organizational adoption, right? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't just mean more views of your reports, right? And so if that administrator doesn't actually understand what are people trying to do, what do we want them to do? They just can't be effective. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, we're going to go back to this comment, um, Alex, yeah. Publishing the web to get past licensing. I saw that comment and it made me laugh. Because what, yeah. what I love it's about this so, is... Yeah, go ahead. No, no, it's simply the fact that I love that when you do... I mean, I, I have my own... So I have, of course, with work, my license there, but I have my own like private license. So when I do my work on my own, I tend to just only publish to web because I'm doing it from a website, all that kind of stuff. I love the fact that before you do that, how many warnings you actually get. It's like, are you sure? This will open your data. Are you really, really sure? you got to click like three different buttons to get past it. And I love how safe it is to do that. Yeah, that's a, and that's a lot improved from say a few years ago when we just assumed people knew this quite literally puts your information on the world wide web. And if you use Bing, you can literally search it and you can mm. find it. So mm. there was for a very long time, I think this is a lot less common now, but for a long time, there was this misconception. And I remember seeing at least one blog entry with someone saying, oh, yeah, but I only put it on our intranet. So it's not really open. It's like, oh, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> the other thing sort of in that in that vein to get past licensing is let's put up too many blockers to getting a pro license. Mm. So guess what? And Bernat kind of touches this on this a little bit in the chat with, if you deny pro licenses heavily, and I mm. get it, sometimes there needs to be a reason. You might, might need an approval. You might ask for some initial training, right? Uh, there's a variety of gates that you might legitimately ask for, but if you make it too difficult, people might just say, well, Power BI Desktop is enough. I'll share those files on the file system or SharePoint or whatever. Yeah. And then we don't have nearly as good visibility into what's happening. I would mm -hmm. much rather encourage use of the service. Mm -hmm. We have all the activity log data mm -hmm. of what's happening and we can actually use things like row level security, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, we've all seen, I'm sure, this sharing. I mean, also Alex has just uh, mentioned this as well now. Um, sharing with the PBIX files between in SharePoint. And it's just, I can see where people are, um, are coming from. Um, I, I understand that it's, 
maybe when you're first starting using the tool, kind of, okay, you're kind of familiar with that format that you had with Excel, for example. You have your Excel file and you can share it and many people access it and that's just how you use that file. Um, but perhaps that's also something when you talk about, you know, this roadmap and how, the, how you adopt um, practices when you're using Power BI, that that's something that has to be looked at before you actually start publishing reports, this concept of sharing PBX files, because it's not, it's a, it's an unpleasant way of working for sure. And there is no way of tracking who's changed what. And it's also, for me, it's just a simple acceptance thing. If you're going to use this, this is part of the cost that you have to de deal with. And you can't adopt it just by sharing PBX because it sucks, basically. And <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really... Yeah, and I think we can sell it to people, right? If if really we say we want to be able to govern it better, right? We want to see the activity. We want it to be secured mm. uh, with our various ways we can do that, et cetera, right? But we can sell it to people with the advantages. You get to schedule refresh, right? Um, you get to you get to set up which one of your other people can view it. Mm. You can create an app. So if your manager or your executives need a nicer way to see a scaled down, more elegant delivery of your set of reports, as opposed to cracking open a PBIX file, right? So mm. there's all these advantages that I think we can say for the user side. And then on the admin side, right, we've got, we've got all the data, what's really happening. Yeah. I mean, do you see yourself in the past few years, it's, it's improved, generally speaking, the, the adopt and how companies uh, uh, adopt? From what I saw, I have very little, I've only worked internally with the companies that I've worked for. Um, I've seen, from my perspective, a general improvement of how people kind of adopt Power BI. But of course, you have much, much wider experience. So do you see that as well? Or is it just still pretty much what it always was? I feel like the people that I talk to are the people that are struggling. Okay. And 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 what do they come to me with? They come to me with here's the things that aren't working. So I had sort of a colored uh, and so my initial reaction would be no, there's still so many challenges. But the reason that there's challenges is this is self-service BI, right? So we're taking a tool that is take how how monumentally powerful a tool like Excel is, right? Mm. Take that times 10 or more, right? Mm. This is such a monumentally powerful tool that we're putting in the hands of analysts and asking them to create data models and write DAX. Jeff, no, I rarely write DAX anymore. Don't ask me about <laughs> that. <laughs> um, I know about context, right? I know about calculate, but no, I'm not your DAX person. I'm um, jealous of that. I, you know, a few years ago, I did actually teach uh, beginning Power BI training classes, but cool. yeah, I, uh, my, my saw is not sharp anymore. <laughs> so anyways, um, what in the heck was I just saying about, I uh, see Jeff, you got me off my train of thought. It's your fault. It does that, you know, he just, he just yeah. writes his That's comments. That's we were supposed to meander, so. Exactly. No, it was about recording um, saying that adopting power bi you said i think you were saying we pretty much stayed on the same level and the same same issues come up i think roughly. yeah and i know there's some organizations that are doing amazing work right they've got this excellent center of excellence and i guess i shouldn't say i've got one person in my in my online course that whenever she talks i'm like dang you guys are doing some really cool stuff right nice. so so i guess i shouldn't overemphasize um but Every, everybody's challenged, right? This is self-service BI and trying to, this was where I lost my train of thought earlier, right? <laughs> trying to balance, right? Who's doing what and who's doing it securely and safely and efficiently and mm. yeah. Yeah. Um, working so deep with this area and, and, and your admin and your <laughs> governance, is there, um, is there any areas of, that you miss that you used to work with? It's like, oh, I wish I could... <laughs> You think, oh, Power, Power mm. Query is so awesome. I miss doing lots of cool stuff with Power Query, that kind of stuff. Ah, you know? uh, yeah. I would never really got to where I was a master of the Power Query side 
or even the DAX side. Now, where I was really pretty good in the past was all of the data modeling stuff. So the facts, the dimensions, the relationships, the what, how do we need change tracking, right? So the data modeling side of things and planning and implementing that, right? If I said I had to miss one piece of truly digging in and doing the implementation, um, just because that's the part that I was that I was best at, that would okay. that'd be it. Nice, fair enough. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, I would absolutely consider myself a generalist, to be honest. I, I would never say, oh, I'm very specific towards, towards this area. And I do feel sometimes it would be nice to say, oh, yes, I'm, I consider myself an expert in this area. I'm just like, no, I'm just not. It's not something that I've ever been able to kind of, I'm not sure if it's a time thing or just simply because I, I get pulled in different directions or because I kind of like sitting there in the middle, kind of like touching every single point. I'm not sure. But yeah, I think definitely, I mean, I, I, I would just suppose most people would throw themselves in that category as well, right? A generalist. Uh, I think I think, a, I think a lot of people would. Yeah. Because, you know, when you work in the data space, especially if you're going to say, well, you know, we have to find the source data, we have to ingest it, we have to model it, we have to create reports, we have to distribute it to others, right? There's so many people that really kind of have to touch every piece of that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's less common for someone to say, I'm really only going to focus on this narrow piece. And it's not unheard of, mm -hmm. but a little bit less common, I think. I find most of my time these days is getting confused as to different sorts of I've con I've pretty convinced that you can put any single word after lake and it'll be something data lake lake house and I've trying, been trying to work out like what's the difference between a, a lake or a data lake and a data lake house and I just think you just put any, any word on these things and it'll be some kind of data lake that I'm just not familiar with so that's the sort of thing I spend a kind of googling what the hell is this word that I just discovered and feeling I'm like five years behind on so many different things and just trying to do a little bit of this do a little bit of that. Um, but it's a uh, lake database, yeah. right? Exactly. That, that, I mean, that, I'm sure that I'm not sure if I've heard that before, but yeah, why not? That, that can be a lake database as well. I don't know anymore. I was but, once talking to somebody, um, and it was back when I had to do some pre-sales work for when I used to work for a consulting company. And, uh, so that wasn't always my favorite thing, but anyways, um, <laughs> it took me like 15 minutes of them talking about what they have now for me to actually figure out they were using the word data lake to basically just mean their entire data estate, a database, files, whatever. It was just their data estate. And it, I mean, I was struggling to understand what they were talking about until I had this light bulb moment. So terms mm. can be so confusing. For sure. Absolutely. It goes back to what you said before about you know using one set of jargon inside the company and then also outside the company. Because you can work at a company for a good few years and then you leave and go to go somewhere else. And you're like, you're using different words for so many things that we, I was speaking about before. It's just, I mean, and the pronunciation of Azure alone is, is hard enough. As Then you go to a different company and they're all saying Asia or whatever. And it's just, uh, yeah, hard to keep track of, of such things. Oh, uh, totally agree. Yeah. But uh, yeah, very cool stuff. Um, thank you, by the way, very, for talking all about admin and, and data governance. Uh, as I mentioned, it's something that's at the start, it's something that I don't touch on as much as I should, though I'm kind of starting to get there now. So really interesting topics that you've, um, that you've brought to this, um, this chat today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me. This was fun. I can't believe it's almost been an hour already. It just went like, bam. It has indeed. That's how it goes. I mean, for me, I'm not sure if you can see it on my face, but you probably can't. I'm absolutely sweating because my office is ridiculously hot. Oh, um, no. It's yeah. I can't I can't switch the fan on during this during this because obviously the, the mic picks it up. It's like um, see, I've got through the entire glass of water because I'm just like I'm. I'm oh, we better we better keep it then. You need to hydrate. Oh, it's all good. I'm, I, I've got a good couple minutes before I collapse. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> But um, no, thank you very much for joining. It's been really, really insightful, very good fun. Everyone in the comments, thank you very much as well for kind of keeping us going with your questions and your comments and what have you. I tried my best to stay on track today. See, I didn't do much random uh, random questions. Last week I was asking Charles Weber about basketball, so there you go. Um, so, cool. 
All I right. shall be back uh, next Thursday at, um, I think, at the usual time-ish. I forget with who, as I always do forget these things. But um, what are you going to do? Take care, everyone. Thank you very much, and uh, goodbye.